Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibylla Harold. Lesson 3 is ready for teaching on October 15. It's titled Understanding Human Nature and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we're going to open your word and before we do we need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit to guide us and to bless us individually and as people from all around the world in various situations who are studying your word today. Today I'd like to pray for those who are alone and by themselves are listening to this podcast, whether it be part of their daily routine or whether it be something special, for those who are using it as their regular daily family worship, for church groups who gather together and Sabbath school lesson sharing, For those who are ill or disabled in some way, Lord, please help us to know more that you are with us in our situation. For those who are visually impaired or blind, for which this was originally designed, Lord, I pray that each person who is listening may be blessed. For those who are driving to work, for those who are walking or jogging or cycling for exercise, for those who are listening while they are at work, for those who are doing housework at home and caring for children and families, and for those who are carers, who are looking after others in need. Lord, I pray that as we listen in whatever our setting, that we may understand your love for us and be able to share it with those about us. Bless us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Let's read that again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2 verse 7. The tension between God's word, you shall die, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and Satan's counterfeit promise, you certainly will not die, in chapter 3, verse 4, was not restricted to the Garden of Eden. It is echoed throughout history. Many people try to harmonise the words of Satan with the words of God. For them, the warning, you shall die, refers only to the perishable physical body, while the promise, you certainly will not die, is an allusion to an immortal soul or spirit. But this approach doesn't work. For example, can contradictory words of God and Satan be harmonised? Is there an immaterial soul or spirit that consciously survives physical death? There are many philosophical and even scientific attempts to answer these questions. But, as Bible-based Christians, we must recognise that only the Almighty One, the One who created us, knows us perfectly, as we read in Psalm 139. And this beautiful psalm reads as follows, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. 
for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skilfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Thus, only in his word to us, the Scriptures, can we find answers to these crucial questions. This week, we will consider how the Old Testament defines human nature and the condition of human beings at death. Sunday, October 9, A Living Being Read Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 to 27, and chapter 2, verses 7 and 19. What similarities and differences can you see between the way God created the animals and the way he created humanity? What does Genesis 2, 7 tell us about human nature? Genesis chapter 1 Beginning at verse 24, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And verse 19, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam, to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. The Genesis account declares that on the sixth day of creation week, the Lord God brought to life land animals and the first human beings, a couple as we read in chapter 1 verses 24 to 27. We are told that he formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky in chapter 2 verse 19. He also formed a man from the dust of the ground we read in the same chapter verse 7. Although both animals and man alike were made from the ground, the formation of the man was distinct from that of the animals in two main ways. First, God shaped the man physically and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, we read in verse 7. He was a physical entity before he became a living one. Second, God created humanity as both male and female in the very image and likeness of the Godhead, as we read in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. 
Genesis 2 verse 7 explains that the infusion of the breath of life into the physical body of Adam transformed him into a living being. The Hebrew words are nefesh cheya, or literally, a living soul. It means that each of us does not have a soul that can exist apart from the body. Rather, each of us is a living being or a living soul. The claim that this soul is a conscious entity that can exist separate from the human body is a pagan, not a biblical idea. Understanding the true nature of humanity prevents us from accepting the popular notion of an immaterial soul and all the dangerous errors built upon that belief. There is no conscious existence of any isolated part of the human being separated from the person as a whole. God created us in a fearful and wonderful way, and we should not speculate beyond what the scriptures actually say about this specific matter. In fact, not only is the very nature of life a mystery, scientists still can't agree on exactly what it means for something to be alive, but even more mysterious is the nature of consciousness. How does the few pounds of material tissue, cells and chemicals in our heads, the brain, hold and create immaterial things such as thoughts and emotions? Those who study this idea admit that we really don't know. And so to finish the day, what a miracle life is. Why should we rejoice in the gift of not just life, but of eternal life as well, an even greater miracle? Monday, October 10. The soul who sins shall die. Read Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 4 and 20 and Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. How can these verses help us understand the nature of the human soul? Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And verse 20, The soul whose sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Human life in this sinful world is fragile and transitory, as we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 8. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins." The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All Flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands for ever. Nothing infected by sin can be eternal by nature. Therefore, As we read in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Death is the natural consequence of sin, which affects all life here. 
On this matter, there are two important biblical concepts. One is that human beings and animals both die. As stated by King Solomon, Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. The second concept is that the physical death of a person implies the cessation of his or her existence as a living soul. Remember the Hebrew word nephesh? In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God had warned Adam and Eve that if they should ever sin by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would die. Echoing this warning, the Lord reinforced the point in Ezekiel 18, chapter 4 and verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. This statement has two main implications. One is that Since all human beings are sinners, all of us are under the unavoidable process of ageing and dying, as we read in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 18. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Another implication is that this biblical concept makes void the popular notion of a supposed natural immortality of the soul. If the soul is immortal and exists alive in another realm after death, then we don't really die after all, do we? In contrast, the biblical solution for the dilemma of death is not a bodiless soul migrating either into paradise or into purgatory or even into hell. The solution is indeed the final resurrection of those who died in Christ, as Jesus stated in his sermon on the bread of life in John 6 verse 40. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so to finish the day, why is the surety of the second coming, which is made certain by Christ's first coming, and after all, what good was Christ's first coming without the second, so crucial to all that we believe? What hope would we have without the promise of his return? Tuesday, October 11, the Spirit returns to God. Read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 to 7. What contrast can you see between these two biblical passages? How can they help us to understand better the human condition in death? And also look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 22. Let's begin with Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And Ecclesiastes 12, beginning at verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, 
I have no pleasure in them. When the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down. When the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows grow dim. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your Creator before the living cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. And Genesis 7 and verse 22. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the Spirit of life, all that was on the land, died. As already seen, the Bible teaches that the human being is a soul, as we read in Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the soul ceases to exist when the body dies. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, and that reads, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine, the soul whose sins shall die. And verse 20, The soul whose sins shall die, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But what about the spirit? Does it not remain conscious even after the death of the body? Many Christians believe so, and they even try to justify their views by quoting Ecclesiastes 12.7, which says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. But this statement does not suggest that the Spirit of the dead remains conscious in God's presence. Ecclesiastes 12, 1-7, in quite dramatic terms, describes the ageing process culminating with death. Verse 7 refers to death as the reversal of the creation process mentioned in Genesis 7. As already stated, on the sixth day of the creation week, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, it says in verse 7 of chapter 2, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. But now, Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells us that the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the breath of life that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and that he also has provided to all other human beings, returns to God, or in other words, simply stops flowing into and through them. We should keep in mind that Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 describes the dying process of all human beings and does so without distinguishing between the righteous and the wicked. If the alleged spirits of all who die survive as conscious entities in the presence of God, then are the spirits of the wicked with God? This idea is not in harmony with the overall teaching of the scriptures. Because the same dying process happens both to human beings and to animals, death is nothing else than ceasing to exist as living beings. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 and 20. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. As stated by the psalmist in Psalm 104, verse 29, You hide your face, they are troubled, you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. 
And so to finish the day, we often say that death is just part of life. Why is that so wrong? Death is the opposite of life, the enemy of life. What great hope, then, is found in this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Wednesday, October 12. The dead know nothing. Read Job chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, Psalm 115, verse 17, Psalm 146, verse 4, and Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 10. What can we learn from these passages about the condition of human beings at death? First of all, Job 3, beginning at verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breasts that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. And Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. And Psalm 146, verse 4, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. And Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, Do it with all your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Some Bible commentators argue that these passages, Job 3, 11 to 13, Psalm 115, verse 17, Psalm 146, verse 4, and Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 10, written in poetic language, cannot be used to define the condition of human beings at death. It is true that sometimes poetry can be ambiguous and easily misunderstood, but this is not the case with these verses. Their language is clear, and their concepts are in full harmony with the overall Old Testament teachings on the subject. First, in Job chapter 3, the patriarch deplores his own birth because of all the suffering. In our more dire moments, who hasn't wished that he or she had never been born? He recognises that if he had died at his birth, he would have remained asleep and at rest. We read in verses 11 and 13, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? And verse 13, For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. Psalm 115 defines the location where the dead are kept as a place of silence because the dead do not praise the Lord in Psalm 115 verse 17. This hardly sounds as if the dead, the faithful and thankful dead, are in heaven worshipping God. According to Psalm 146, the mental activities of the individual cease with death. In verse 4 we read, His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. This is a perfect biblical depiction of what happens at death. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 adds that the death know nothing, and in the grave, as it says in verses 5 and 10, there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom. These statements confirm the biblical teaching that the dead are unconscious. The biblical teaching of unconsciousness in death should not generate any panic in Christians. First of all, there is no everlasting burning hell or temporary purgatory waiting for those who die unsaved. Second, there is an amazing reward waiting for those who die in Christ. No wonder that 
as we read in the Desire of Ages, page 787, to the believer, death is but a small matter. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. End of quote. Actually, in the end of the quote, there are two series of texts that are referred to. John 8, verses 51 to 52. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. And Colossians 3, verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so to finish the day, think about the dead in Christ. They close their eyes in death, and whether in the grave 1,500 years or just five months, it's all the same to them. The next thing they know is the return of Christ. How then might one argue that, in one sense, the dead have it better than we, the living, do? Thursday, October 13, Resting with the Forefathers. Read Genesis chapter 25, verse 8, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, 1 Kings 2, 10, and 1 Kings 22, verse 40. What do these texts add to your understanding of death? First of all, Genesis 25, verse 8, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And First Kings chapter 2 and verse 10, So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And 1 Kings 22, verse 40, So Ahab rested with his fathers. Then Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. The Old Testament expresses in different ways the ideas of death and burial. One way is the notion of being gathered to one's people. For example, about Abraham, we are told that he breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people in Genesis 25 verse 8. Aaron and Moses also were gathered to their respective people, and we read about that in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 50. And die on the mountain which you ascend and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. What does the fact that both good and bad kings went to the same place at death teach us about the nature of death? Second Kings 24 verse 6. So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiachin his son reigned in his place. And Second Chronicles 32 and verse 33. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honoured him at his death. Then Manasseh his son reigned in his place. Another way of describing death is by stating that someone rested with the forebears. About King David's death, the Bible says that he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, 1 Kings 2.10. The same expression also is used in reference to several other Hebrew kings, both faithful kings and unfaithful kings. We can identify at least three meaningful aspects of resting with the forebears. One is the idea that sooner or later the time will come when we need to rest from our own tiring labours and sufferings. Another idea is that we are not the first and only ones to follow that undesirable trail because our forebears already have gone ahead of us. A third idea is that 
By being buried close to them, we are not alone, but remain together even during the unconsciousness of death. This might not make much sense to some modern individualistic cultures, but it was very meaningful in the ancient times. Those who die in Christ can be buried close to their loved ones, but even so there is no communication between them. They will remain unconscious until that glorious day when they will be awakened from their deep sleep to rejoin their loved ones who died in Christ. And so to finish today, imagine what it would be like if the dead were actually conscious and could see what life was like down here, especially for their loved ones, who often suffer terribly after their death. Why then should the truth that the dead sleep be so comforting to the living? Friday, October 14. If you have ever been in surgery and were put out with general anaesthesia, you might have had a faint idea of what it must be like for the dead. But even then, when under anaesthesia, your brain still functions. Imagine what it would be like for the dead when all brain function everywhere was totally stopped. Their experience in death, then, is to close their eyes, and as far as each dead person who ever lived is concerned, the next thing they will know is either the second coming of Jesus or his return after the millennium. Let's read Revelation 20, verses 7 to 15. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then the death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Until then, all the dead, the righteous and the wicked, rest for what will seem to them to be an instant. For those of us who remain alive, death seems as if it lasts for a long time. For the living it does, but for the dead it seems to last only an instant. In the Great Controversy, page 539, we read, If it were true that the souls of all men pass directly to heaven at the hour of dissolution, then we might well covet death rather than life. Many have been led by this belief to put an end to their existence. When overwhelmed with trouble, perplexity and disappointment, it seems an easy thing to break the brittle thread of life and soar away into the bliss of the eternal world. End of quote. And then on the same book, pages 549 and 550, we read, Nowhere in the sacred scriptures is found the statement that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked to their punishment at death. The patriarchs and prophets have left no such assurance. Christ and his apostles have given no hint of it. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven. They are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. And so to finish today, 
Here are our discussion questions, and there are three of them. One, how does the biblical notion of the human being as a whole, who remains conscious only as an undivided person, help us to understand better the nature of death? Two, the world has been taken over by the theory of the natural immortality of the soul, with all its uncountable ramifications. Why then is our message about the state of the dead so crucial? Why also, even among Christians, do we find such strong opposition to what is really a wonderful teaching? And three, how should an understanding of the state of the dead protect us from what might appear before our eyes? That is, why can't we always trust what we see, especially if what we see or think we see is the spirit of a dead relative, as some have reported seeing? And now it's time for our mission story. Here with Inside Story is Sibella. Every Cent is Sacred by Andrew McChesney. Shaimala's eyes widened with surprise as she read the handwritten note tucked in an envelope with two money orders worth $110.52 US. The letter came from the US East Coast and the money orders were made out to Global Mission, the frontline arm of Adventist Mission whose missionaries start new groups of believers in unreached territories. I have enclosed a donation to Global Mission to help people learn about the love of God, the letter read. I love God and try to help spread the gospel in my neighbourhood. It was the next part of the note that astonished Shaimala, a donor specialist at Global Mission. The writer explained that the $110.52 donation consisted of pennies that she had found on the street. When her jar of pennies got full, she cashed them in and sent the donation. This gift is pennies that I collected for Jesus, she wrote. I hope it will bring smiles to someone as you share the love of God. Another surprising letter arrived at Global Missions office at the General Conference a few weeks earlier. The letter from the US West Coast contained no note, but the enclosed $165 check spoke volumes. It was issued by a prison on behalf of an inmate. With inmates earning up to $55 a month at the prison, the donor would have had to work at least three months for the gift, and it wasn't his first donation, Shaimala said. A third letter was opened by Nympha, who, with Shaimala, runs the donor relations department at Global Mission. The letter came from a man who had called Global Mission's hotline a few days earlier to inquire where the Global Mission had received a donation submitted through its website. Nympha found that the caller's bank had rejected the transaction. When the caller asked for an alternative way to donate, she suggested a cheque or a wire transfer. A cheque for $70,000 arrived a few days later. The donation was the proceeds from the sale of a piece of property. The man promised God that if the property sold, he would give everything to mission, Nympha said. Stories about the faithfulness of people to God's mission deeply touch the hearts of Shaimala, Nympha and others who work at the global mission. Whether the donation is $1 and one donor has sent three $1 bills every month for years, or if it's $70,000, every penny goes to frontline work. Every cent that we get is no ordinary cent, Nympha said. When we receive a donation, especially when we learn about how that money got to us or why it was sent to us, we are reminded that every cent is sacred. It is the Lord's money. Every cent goes only to finish the work so Jesus can come. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.